So Mary is the Director of Health and Biomedical Surveys at NatSEN. She leads a team of 15 researchers working on some of the most important health surveys in the country, such as the Health Survey for England, Diet and Nutrition Survey, the Child and Adolescent Mental Health Survey, and the Adult Psychiatric Morbidity Survey. She's got extensive experience of successfully managing complex social surveys across a variety of modes and topic areas. And before she was director, she led new business development at Natsen Survey Research Centre and oversaw the web and telephone survey work. So, Mary, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Vanessa. And um, thank you for the excellent um introduction and thank you everybody for being here today. I'm really impressed with the numbers. It's great to be speaking to so many people, especially um, after the um, England win yesterday. So um, yeah, thank everybody for being here and let's get started with the first session. So this session is focusing on what has been happening over the past year to the uh, cross-sectional studies about health. So we will have um, a number of presentations and uh, we will get started with um, Chloe Robinson, uh, who is from Natsen. Chloe is a research director and she specializes in managing complex large scale social surveys with particular expertise in biosocial data collection methods. And she has worked on a range of surveys at Natsen, including the Health Survey for England and National Diet and Nutrition Survey. And Chloe will give us an overview of the changes, uh, what has been happening to the um, official health surveys. So this is surveys that are uh, commissioned by NHS Digital or Public Health England. So over to you, Chloe. So yeah, good morning, everyone. So yeah, as Mari said, I'm going to be presenting on a year of change for official health surveys. Um, so given an update on health surveys at Matsen, um, we run many official health surveys for NHS Digital and Public Health England. But I'm going to give an overview of what, how they've been adapted since the pandemic, um, and how we've had to consider other methods and modes in the last year. Um, Let's check that works. So in particular, I'm going to be talking about four different surveys. So they are the Health Survey for England, HC, uh, the Adult Psychiatric Morbidity Study, Mental Health of Children and Young People, and the National Diet and Nutrition Survey. So cover those four surveys, and as I said, give an overview of the methods and content, but give an update on what has happened in the last year because of COVID. Uh, Natsen also carries out the Scottish Health Survey and ELSA, the English Longitudinal Study of Ageing, but they're going to be covered with separate presentations later this morning. So to get straight into it, I'm going to start by talking about the Health Survey for England. Uh, so a brief overview, what is the Health Survey for England? Um, so it's an annual snapshot of the nation's health. It's a continuous yearly survey, starts on, in January each year. It's a health examination survey. So there are questions, but then also measurements and samples. It tracks trends over time, it started back in 91. So 30 years of data, it's cross-sectional uh, and it's nationally representative sample of England. And we aim for 8,000 adults and 2,000 children each year. Commissioned by NHS Digital and carried out by Natsen, in collaboration with UCL. Chloe, um, sorry, we can see your um, notes slide rather than the presentation view. All right, sorry. So there we go. So um, I'm just going to go through some of the core content that we cover each year on the HSC. Uh, we won't go through each of these, but things like general health, long standing illness, hypertension, diabetes, and so on. Um, and then we have a nurse visit where we take measurements and um, bio samples and we cover things like prescribed medication, waist and hip, and we have blood, saliva and urine samples. On the HC, there's also an opportunity for other funders to fund additional content. And here are some examples of some of the things that we've covered in recent years. Uh, so dental health in 2019, CVD back in 2017, and some of the others, but again, I won't go through each of them. Okay, so moving on to actually give an update on what we've been doing with the last few survey years. 
Um, so starting back with HC 2019, there was a report published in December of last year, so December 2020, um, covering the 2019 survey and findings from that year. Um, and the 2019 data will be archived in autumn of this year, so 2021. In 2020, as you can imagine, fieldwork was paused in March 2020. We did hope to go back into field later in the year, but it became apparent that wasn't going to happen. So we didn't resume fieldwork at all in 2020. Um, so there is a limited quarter one 2020 data set, and that will also be archived later this year or early next year. For 2021, we did go back into the field. We started fieldwork in January 21. Um, and I'll describe how that's different in a moment. Uh, so a little bit on the 2019 publication, so for the HC 2019 survey year. So as I said, it was published in December 2020. Um, there's a summary of key findings, individual reports on each of those chapters on the screen, um, and then various methods related reports as well. And there is a link to that publication on this slide, which you'll have available to you. Um, in for HC, or well, this year, so writing this year, but without HC 2020 data, we've found that there's been an opportunity to write alternative reports this year without the 2020 data. And there are going to be two extra HC reports being written this year. And they are on self-reported versus measured height and weight. Um, so in 2018, 18% did not have a BMI um, measure for within the survey from their measured height and weight. And we're finding that over time, people are increasingly refusing to give either height or weight, and therefore we don't have a valid BMI measure for everyone. Um, and then of course, with alternative modes, so telephone, web surveys, et cetera, we can't actually measure height and weight. Um, so this report is gonna be a comparison of measured height and weight with self-reported height and weight and looking into the difference between the two and then being able to apply what we find to the self-reported height and weight in the future for HSC and for other surveys. Uh, and this builds on the analysis by PHE using the active live survey and HSC previously. And then the second extra report being drafted this year is an ethnicity report and data set. And it's a combined data set to allow us to look at the main ethnic groups um, and where possible looking at the 18 census um, ethnicity categories. It's a nine year data set, 2011 to 2019. And in the report, we'll look at key trends. So overweight, obesity, health related behaviors, um, other things like general health, diabetes, hypertension, smoking and alcohol where possible. And both of those reports will be published in early 22. So early next year. So moving on to the current fieldwork year, so HC 2021, lots of years. Um, so let, to let you know what we're actually doing this year. Um, so we started the year, so quarter one, January to March, with an opt-in to the survey. Um, so this was when we were in lockdown um, before restrictions started to ease. So for those first three months, we had an opt-in to the survey. So we sent out letters using the same sample as we would normally asking participants to get in touch with us instead um, and they could do that using either a free phone number or an email address or they could complete an online form with their contact details and then our interviewers would get in touch with them um, and would arrange to do a telephone interview um, so interviewers in their own homes would telephone participants in their homes and conduct an interview over the phone from april um, and up to now, so in July, as restrictions eased, we moved to doorstep recruitment, which is also known as knock to nudge. And this is where interviewers go out. So rather than sending an opt-in letter, we sent the normal advance letter. Then interviewers go out and they make contact on the doorstep um, and arrange an interview if possible or arrange a telephone interview. So again, with interviewers back in their own homes, um, conducting the HC over the phone. So that's continued to this month. Um, and there isn't a decision yet for what we'll do from August uh, until the end of the year, but the hope is that we will re resume possibly in home and nurse visits later this year. Uh, when and if we do, there'll still be the flexibility between telephone interviewing and face-to-face -face interviewing for any participant that still has a preference to be interviewed over the phone. Uh, 
so with this slide, I was just going to talk through some of the ways that we've needed to change the survey um, so that it can be conducted over the telephone. Um, so the first thing is that we recommend that multi-person households are interviewed separately. So for the HSE, for the face-to-face -face HSE, we do what's called concurrent interviewing, which means that household members can all be together and they can be asked questions in turn, um, which is a fairly efficient way of actually administering the survey. But without being able to actually see people, um, we found it's much better if individuals are interviewed separately. So that's our recommendation over the phone. Um, of course, height and weight, measured height and weight is not possible, uh, but we do have self-reported height and weight for children and adults on the survey. Uh, we have show cards on HC and they're an essential part of the survey. So they're cards that list all the answer options to questions, gives a res respondent participant a chance to actually read through answer lists um, before selecting their answer. Show cards are essential. So we either, for the opt-in, we sent them from the office now that it's doorstep recruitment, they're handed out on the door um, when the interviewer makes an appointment. Um, and if anyone loses them, they're also available online. We have self-completions in HSE, and these are now sent after the interview rather than being done during the interview. Uh, and it's up to the participant to return them to the office. We have CASI, so computer-assisted self-interviewing on HSE for young people. Um, which are smoking and drinking questions. And these questions are being asked if appropriate, um, rather than using CASI, because obviously a participant can't use the interviewer's laptop over the phone. Uh, data linkage and follow-up consent are not included in the telephone version because they are currently written signed consent. So they're not included for telephone. The, all the information leaflets and thank you leaflet are either sent in advance or sent after. So the thank you leaflet is sent with the self-completions. Um, so posted and they are also available online. The nurse visit has been postponed, but we are still collecting agreement to the nurse visit and have been doing that all year. Uh, and it's a much shorter interview. So the HC is roughly an hour long, but we've reduced the content to about 30 minutes. So that's without the height and weight without the self-completions within the interview, without consent to data linkage, and then there are fewer questions as well. So that's how we've adapted the survey. Um, it's still very early, but just a very brief overview of HC21 response so far. So for January to March for the opt-in, we found that around a fifth opted into the survey in each of those months. And of those around 80% took part. Still very early to say anything on the doorstep recruitment in terms of response, but we do know that it's much more successful in recruiting participants to take part than opt-in. Um, however, telephone interviewing does have a lower response than face-to-face -face interviewing. And then I was just going to say a little bit about um, HC video interviewing. So we did a very small trial of using video technology, so MS Teams in this case, to conduct HSC interviews, um, so using video, with the potential to improve the interview experience. So the theory is that with a video uh, enabled interview, then you can improve the rapport between interviewers and participants. Interviewers can look to see whether a participant might be confused or needs a bit more time to answer a question and so on. So we just wanted to test whether it would be possible to do video interviewing with HSC. We did that in three stages. So stage one was a feasibility test just to test the technology uh, and the interviewer training. For stage two, we tested the take up during opt-in. And for stage three, we've tested the take up during doorstep recruitment. Um, so overall, brief conclusions are that the technology worked very well. The interviewers liked video interviewing, those that were trained in it. Um, it's a relatively straightforward video interview compared with, I think, with some other survey so we don't do any document sharing um, but interviewers do need to navigate between using the video the teams and also their interview uh, CAPI program. We found with the opt-in there was around a 10 to 15 percent preference for video opt-in um, so whichever method that they opted into the survey we would ask would you prefer to do this by telephone or video and around 10 to 15 percent said video. Um, but we have found with the doorstep recruitment that there's been a very, very low take up um, of video interviewing, a preference for video interviewing. 
Uh, and general feedback is that telephone is just easier. It's just much easier to pick up the phone. They don't need to log on to Teams. Um, so this our video pilot um, was very small scale and we may return to video in the future when there's more evidence from other surveys. Okay, so moving on to next year, HC22. Um, so the plan is that fieldwork will start in January 22. Um, and we have a full in-home dress rehearsal in August and September of this year to test everything with nurses. Um, so face-to-face, -face, back to our usual model. Um, but we will still have telephone mode available for next year if there are any concerns from somebody in the home and they would prefer to be interviewed over the phone. Uh, so that's the main HC, and then I was just then going to talk about the HC feasibility study. Um, so this is running alongside the main HSE. And when we stopped fieldwork in 2020, it gave us an opportunity uh, to test transferring some of the HSE content from face-to-face -face mode to online and postal modes. So two more different modes to telephone. Um, and we were looking at the overall response using those two modes, looking at agreement rates to a future nurse visit and the consent rate to data linkage and future recontact with those modes. Just to run through the methods. Um, so it was done in two stages. So there was an adult stage and then a child stage. Uh, so for adults, we were looking for two adults per household. It was a postcode address file sample, so random sample. We we're aiming for 6,000 responses. It was a push to web design. So we invited people to take part online first. 20 minute online questionnaire, mobile first questionnaire design so people can complete on their phones. We sent an invitation letter and then two reminders and the postal questionnaires were sent with the second reminder, two per household. And there was a conditional five pound incentive. Uh, for the child stage, it was a named sample from the adult survey. We hope to have around 1500 children, 1500 children with reconciliation to remove duplicate children. So this would be where there were two parents who completed the survey but gave details of the same children was a whole process to remove those duplicate children. We selected two children within the age groups 0 to 12 and 13 to 15, which is the same approach we take with the main HSC. And there were three different types of questionnaire. So one for parents 0 to 12, one for children 8 to 12, and one for children 13 to 15. Uh, and for the older children, we also had an online equivalent questionnaire available for them. As I said, one of the main purposes of the feasibility was to actually test response with various things. So this is a slight insight into the findings that will be published later this year. Um, but a brief overview of the feasibility study response. So for stage one for adults, as I said, we were aiming for 6,000 responses, but we actually achieved slightly less than that target. So about 5,500. We thought we'd have, that was based on an 18 percent response and we thought we'd have roughly 50 50 with online and postal but in fact around 70 percent were online responses for stage two we hoped for 1500 children from the adult sample with a 20 percent response rate but actually there were fewer children in the sample but with a higher response rate so around thousand children but res response was at around 50 percent ish uh, and for the older children who were offered either postal or an online questionnaire, around a third completed it online. So as I said, findings will be available in autumn of this year, and it may inform the design of the HC in the future. Okay, so that was a very quick rundown of HSE. As I said, I'm the, well, I didn't say I'm the uh, research director for HSE. So there's my contact details. But I'm now going to move on to the second survey that I'm going to be talking about, which is the adult psychiatric morbidity survey. Um, so a brief overview of what it is. So it's a probability sample of private households, cross-sectional. Um, it was conducted in Britain in 93 and 2000, and then England in 2007 and 14. Uh, in the last survey, there were 7,500 adults age 16 plus, there's the two phase design. So there's an interview and then that's followed by an assessment by a clinically trained interviewer. It's DHSC funded, NHS digital commissioned, 
uh, and it's run by Natsen and the University of Leicester, but there's a much wider group of academics who contribute to the design and the analysis of the survey. The aims to look at uh, the extent of mental illness, so looking at change over time, inequalities in illness and risk and protective factors, so for example links to physical health, um, and also to look at the proportion of people who get treatment, changes over time and inequalities in treatment. Um, this slide shows some of the content of the survey and the various tools, assessments, questionnaires used to measure them. So I won't go through each of those in detail, but you can just take a look. So as I said, the last survey was done in 2014 and there is a link to that last report based on that 2014 data. Um, but an update on APMS is that there will be a 2022 survey. So the next survey will take place next year. Uh, it'll be similar in scope and design to the previous surveys in the series. So it will be face to face and would need considerable redesign if that's not possible. Aiming for 8,000 adults for the phase one interview and then 700 for the phase two clinical assessments. The next survey will include eating disorders and problem gambling, which were in the 2007, but not the 2014 surveys. So great news that that's going to be happening next year. Um, and our contacts at NatSEN for APMS are Sally, who's a NatSEN associate, and Sarah, who is the research director on APMS. OK, the third survey I'm going to talk about is the mental health of children and young people. Um, so major surveys on the mental health of children and young people carried out in 99, 2004 and 2017. It's a probability sample of children and young people living in England and those registered with a GP. In 2017, data was collected from two to 19 year olds with over 9,000 children and young people. And there was data from children and parents, so an interview with children or parents, depending on age. And then also data from teachers with an online or paper questionnaire. Um, questions are on aspects of children's lives linked to mental health and also it contains DORBA, so the Development and Wellbeing Assessment, which is used to assess a range of mental health conditions. Um, and there are clinical raters on the survey who review the data to assess for a range of mental disorders. It's NHS Digital commissioned uh, and run by NatSEM with ONS. Um, so there are some updates for mental health of children and young people. So there was a follow-up survey last year in 2020. So a follow-up study of previous MHCYP 2017 participants who agreed to recontact, run by NatSEN, ONS and the Universities of Cambridge and Exeter and commissioned by NHS Digital. Uh, the aims were to measure the mental health and well-being of children and young people in England using the SDQ questionnaire, so the Strengths and Difficulties questionnaire and to understand how they've been affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. So it covered things like, uh, so it's the circumstances of children and young people, looking at things like f family dynamics, parent and child anxieties about COVID-19, access to education and health services, and changes in circumstances and activities. It was a 20 minute Cowie web survey with a telephone nudge for non-responders to encourage participation. And the report was published in September of last year with one headline finding here. So rates of probable mental disorders increased from one in nine in 2017 to one in six in 2020. And there's a link there to the findings. Um, and then there has also been a further follow up this year. Um, so a follow up of previous MHCYP 2017 and 20 participants who agreed to recontact again with a 20 minute web or a CATI telephone survey with the same aims to measure the mental health and well-being of children and young people using the strengths and difficulties questionnaire, but also to understand how the COVID-19 pandemic continues to affect children and young people in England. And that report will be published later this year in September 21. Uh, and the contact at NatSEN is Catherine for um, MH. YCP, CYP, uh, and there's a link there. 
Okay, and then the fourth survey I'm going to talk about is the National Diet and Nutrition Survey. Uh, so key facts, uh, it's a cross-sectional continuous survey of diet and nutrition for individuals. Um, it's the only nationally representative data on the types and quantities of food consumed. It's designed to be representative of the general UK population with a sample of around 1,000, so 500 adults and 500 children, um, and provides the information needed to develop and monitor public health and protect food safety. So looking at things like salt and saturated fat against government targets. It is funded by Public Health England and the Food Standards Agency, uh, and it is run by a consortium of NATSEN, MRC Epidemiology Unit, University of Cambridge, and the fieldwork in Northern Ireland is carried out by NISRA. An overview of the content of NDNS, um, so various data sets um, with different things, so household data with demographics, individual data with the interview, physical measurements, self-completion, and biological samples, blood and urine, dietary data, and UK nutrient data bank data. For years 1 to 11 of the survey, uh, the dietary data was collected with a four-day food diary. But from year 12, which started in October 2019, it moved to an online 24-hour dietary recall um, where participants were asked to complete four recalls over a two to seven week period. And that's using Intake24 as the online tool. So an update on NDNS. Um, so going through each of the different survey years for NDNS. So the latest report published at the end of last year, so December 2020, um, included time trend analysis from the first 11 years of the programme and results from years 9 to 11. Uh, year 12 of the survey should have run from October 2019 to June 2020, but field work was paused in March 2020 and it didn't resume. Again, they, I think they hoped to go back out into the field, but it, it didn't happen again for the year 12 survey. So that stopped in March 2020. Year 13 was due to run from July 2020 to March 2021. Um, the fieldwork was also paused. It started again in October 2020, um, but paused again in November and December at the end of last year and started again in January 21. And then the year 14 survey launched as planned. So it started in April 21 and ran through and will run through to March 2022. They have also needed to adapt their fieldwork and change the way that they do things. So um, for year 13 and 14 fieldwork, planned for in-home, but it's all currently being done over the telephone, so completely telephone interviewing. Um, and they are also using the doorstep recruitment method. So they do conduct participant selection on the doorstep, but then the interviewer will arrange a telephone interview to be done at home. A change to the way the dietary recall works. So it's being completed independently by the participant. And then the interviewer phones back to check whether it's complete or provide support if necessary. Um, so that's a change from the in-home protocol where the interviewer would support the first recall during the in-home interview. That's not possible. So respondents are doing it independently um, and only if they can't do it or have forgotten, then the interviewer will support them. Some other fieldwork changes. So the self-reported height and weight measurements, uh, no spot urine samples currently collected, but the hope that when nurses resume, they may be able to do that. Uh, and there's a doorstep protocol for the DLW, doubly labelled water, and the PAM physical activity monitor sub-studies. Um, the hope is that in-home interview will start again this summer, uh, and nurse field work for NDNS will start again in the autumn of this year. And then finally, it was just going to talk about um, an additional study related to diet uh, to NDNS, which is called the DNAC-19 study, so diet, nutrition and activity during the COVID-19 study. So this is a follow-up study of NDNS years 9 to 12 um, with consent to recontact, and it's a web questionnaire on changes in shopping, eating, physical activity, habits um, and changes in the household's financial situation and food security during the COVID-19 pandemic. A 10-minute questionnaire. Uh, with four dietary recalls and then a recent physical activity questionnaire for adults. The study period is August to October 2020. 
um, sorry, the study period was August to October 2020, with the aim to compare diet and physical activity from that period with the original pre-pandemic assessments. And the report is currently being drafted and will be published later this year. And the contact for NDNS is Bev at Matson. And that is all for surveys. Excellent. Thank you very much. <coughs> so, thank you very much, Chloe. Um, as you can as you can see, there has been a lot of change happening across all of the official cross-sectional um, health studies, and and I personally have just been very impressed with the innovation that has been going on. I've been saying that it probably would have taken years and years to try all of these things out on the survey. So um, it's been it's been a really interesting year. So the Health Survey for England, uh, APMS and the Mental Health of Children and Young People study uh, are all surveys that were, um, are commissioned by NHS Digital and access to the data of, of these studies is also managed by NHS Digital. So next we're going to have um, an update on the uh, DAR, so that's the data access request service process and survey data access uh, from uh, Bethan Thomas from NHS Digital. So Bethan is a principal information asset owner at NHS Digital. She has been at NHS Digital for over 10 years and is a senior member of the data access request service. Uh, Bethan leads the team that focuses on the commissioning of commissioning applications and is also the information asset owner for a number of assets, including the NHS Digital uh, survey data sets. Um, so yeah, over to you. Hi, good morning. Thank you. Hopefully you can hear me and you can see my slides okay. Yeah, great. Okay. So hi, everybody. Nice to be here today. Uh, as mentioned, my name is Bethan Thomas and I'm from NHS Digital. For anyone who is unaware of NHS Digital and who we are, we are the national information and technology partner to the health and social care systems. Our mission is to harness the power of information and technology to make health and care better. So as mentioned, I'm going to talk about two main areas today. One's around DARS, the Data Access Request Service, and what that is, and um, some key facts around that. And then I'll talk about the survey assets themselves and what the process is to get access to those, if you would like it. So DARS. DARS is the service that enables access to health and social care data for organisations, be that clinical organisations, research bodies, academia, commissioners and commercial companies. Um, the DARS role is to ensure that access to personal data is provided for organisations that are legally permitted to have access to the data, will look after it according to the necessary IG requirements, will hold it securely, will use it to improve health and care services and will not use it solely for commercial purposes. It's an incredibly robust and thorough process so we can be sure and provide reassurance to the public that only the correct people get access to their data. Um, so some key facts and information about DAS. We process more than a thousand applications for NHS digital data every year. Around half of those are requests from researchers. The other half will be um, the commissioners or commercial organisations. There are 47 data sets available to request from DARS. Um, since last year, we have onboarded 10 new COVID-19 related data sets that have been used for managing the NHS's response to the pandemic. Um, the work with those data sets continues and they include things such as the COVID vaccination status data set and the COVID-19 testing data sets as well. The majority of our data sets cover England only, but some also cover the devolved nations. Most of our assets can be linked to other data sets or to cohort data provided by researchers, unless there's restrictions due to legal or practical reasons. And we also offer a clinical trial service, which can identify an appropriate cohort of patients, um, provide contact details and updates. So the survey data sets. So alongside the data that we collect from health and social care settings, so the data we collect from hospitals or clinics, pharmacies, GPs, community centres, we also offer access to our health surveys, um, three of which that Chloe's talked about already. Um, as Chloe's mentioned, our surveys um, take place with representative samples of the population. 
some take place in homes, some are done postal online surveys, and they are much smaller in terms of the number of records included than the national and the mandated data collections that we do. We commission a range of public health surveys looking into people's health, lifestyle, mental health, behaviour and choices. And you can find out more about the surveys on the web links that are included in the slides. Um, so the following are the health surveys that we've commissioned and are available to researchers via the UK Data Service. There's the Adult Dental Health Survey, Adult Psychiatric Morbidity Survey, Child Dental Health Survey, Health Survey for England, Mental Health of Children and Younger People, Smoking, Drinking and Drug Use Among Young People, Survey of Carers and Households, and the What About Youth Survey. And we are the data controller for all of those data sets. In most instances, um, the survey can be accessed and downloaded from the UK Data Service Portal. And there's two main types of access and associated approval pathways. There's the end user license, which doesn't require a DARS application, or there's a the special user license, which does require a DARS application and data sharing agreement with ourselves. It is also possible to request bespoke versions of the data, but that would require approval from us and normally a data sharing agreement as well. Bespoke requests are those where there's data with additional variables that aren't in the end user license or special user license data set. You want it linking to another asset, you want permission to recontact survey participants, or for example, with the Health Survey of England survey, it could be the serum samples you want access to. So this is a grid showing the surveys and which kind of license is available currently, the type of access. I won't take it through in detail, but I think it's quite helpful to point out which of the survey years are on there and how you can get access to those standard. So if you want to access our data, if it's via an end user license, you need to create an account with the UK Data Service. You navigate to the survey year and the year of choice and select access data. Very simple, it's very easy, and it's a brilliant service and a great way to access the data. Um, you've got to make sure you're following the T's and C's, and that's perfectly standard, and that's great. For a special user license, um, it's the same, but you're also going to need to do a DARS application. And there's some steps on there about what you do. The easiest thing to do is use the email address that's provided and contact our inquiries department, who will then process you through to the relevant people within DARS who'll be able to help you. There is no charge for access to either the UK data service or EUL or SUL data sets. But if you do a DARS request, it will automatically populate a cost into the application form. But don't worry, the case officer will remove that cost for you. So it won't cost you anything. Um, if you want a bespoke request, the best thing to do is contact the NHS Digital Surveys team and their email address is provided. And there's probably will be a charge involved with those. Um, so a quick update on where we are with publishing things. Hopefully this won't be too repetitive of what Chloe's already shared with you. Um, NHS Digital have been incredibly busy over the last year with um, our COVID-19 priorities. So we haven't got as far on the, the pro, far of our progress of disseminating the survey data as we would have liked, but we have still made big steps towards the correct outcomes. Um, mental health of children and young people, the embargo on the 2017 data set has now been lifted and applications can be submitted. Um, two follow-up surveys have taken place and data sets will be available under the UK Data Service Special User Licence. Smoking and drinking and drugs among young people. The 2018 data set will be available later this year under UK Data Service End User Licence. Health Survey for England, the 2019 data set will also be available under you um, end user license later on this summer and APMS 2014 there is plans to create a less reduced data set to replace the one that's currently there and available under special user license. Um, we've also done a lot of work about how we can improve the access to make life easier for um, people out there who want to get access to our data. We have a dedicated page on the DARS website about survey disseminations and we're doing a lot of work with iGuard. iGuard are NHS Digital's independent assurance review group. They look at applications from a layperson and a clinician and a research expertise point of view and provide a recommendation about whether the application should be approved by NHS Digital or not. 
So we're working with them to come up with efficient approval pathways for the special user license data sets, um, approval pathways around the data linkage. So if we're gonna link the survey data, for example, to HES or cancer or mortality, um, looking at what this process is around there to get that speedily sorted. And we're also fully onboarding the Health Survey for England into DARS, which will allow users to access the UK data service special user license data sets for 2016 to 2019 are not currently available. Okay, so the last few slides are just some background information about DARS, it includes all of our links and some more details about the products we have. I'm not going to take you through all of these in detail, but they'll be there in the slides for you to be able to get that information when you require it. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much, Beth, and very, very informative. So the next presentation is from Shanna Christie and Jan McLean from Scotson, and they are presenting about uh, how to replace the large-scale continuous face-to-face -face household survey during a pandemic. So that's the Scottish Health Survey and the changes, COVID-related changes that have uh, taken place on that one. Um, so uh, Shanna, uh, is a research director in the transformation team at Natsen and she's currently leading on projects and surveys which are looking to incorporate innovative methodologies such as web first approaches and digital data collection tools and before this she was a senior researcher at Scotsen responsible for day-to-day -day management of the Scottish Health Survey. Um, and Shanna, along with uh, John McLean, led the development and implementation of the 2021 Health uh, Scottish Health Survey. Um, and Jan McLean is a research director at Scotsen and she's currently leading on the Scottish Health Survey with uh, two decades of creating and using research-based knowledge to support public health and social care practice and policy. Over this time, she has developed and led a wide range of com complex national and local program evaluation, systematic reviews, primary research, large-scale large surveys, including the census and pilot development programs for local providers. And Joan has particular subject knowledge in the fields of public health, mental health, suicide prevention, and self-harm. And she's currently working on an evaluation of the distress brief interventions pilot for the Scottish government. So over to you, Shanna and Joan. Thank you. Um, is that rather embarrassing? <laughs> Bio that I sent in that you had to read out, sorry about that. Um, Okay, so I'm going to take you through what we did in 2020 um, in response to the pandemic. Um, Shanna is moving the slides, so we'll see if we can operate this together. And, um, okay. So the key features of Scottish Health Survey um, are... It's an sorry, sorry, John, uh, guys, you have the notes view on this one, so can you try to change to the presentation view? So is it display settings? Yeah. Uh, swap presenter view and slideshow. Is that working okay? Yep, that's perfect now. Thank Sorry you. about that. I thought I had that. <laughs> Sorry, Joan. Okay, no problem. So the, the Scottish Health Survey runs annually. 2020 was its 16th year. Um, and it's a face-to-face -face survey usually. Um, and we focus on health conditions as well as health related behaviours, such as diet, physical activity, smoking, alcohol consumption. Um, we have a stratified sample of around 10,000 and we aim to achieve around 5,000 adult and 2,000 child interviews per year. It's currently running this year as an opt-in telephone survey and we're um, don't have permission at the moment to do doorstep recruitment and um, we're hoping to move to that though before the end of for the last three months or so of the 21 survey. Okay so I'll now give you some background on what we did in 2020. So we launched as usual um, as everybody else did at the beginning of 2020 hopeful for a, a year of face-to-face -face, um, data collection but of course our field work was also suspended in March um, however, there was a, a demand within um, government and policy um, for us to collect some health data during the pandemic. Um, so in order to do that, we 
quickly looked at a range of options um, for the best way to do that. And the government commissioned us to capture a snapshot um, of health data from the Scottish population during the pandemic, focusing on down on just key national health indicators. So we had a tight development time to turn this around just a couple of months and we um, aimed to collect data for six weeks during um, August and September. We changed the mode to telephone opt-in um, and we had uh, three types of opt-in, so online portal, email and telephone. Um, we also had changed the sample design, it didn't need to be clustered anymore. Um, we assumed based on some telephone work that had already been done, a 10% response, um, which is a lot lower obviously than our usual face-to-face. -face. Um, we actually achieved 15% response, so that was a nice surprise. Um, we um, expected a lower hit rate, we assumed 1.5 adults per house, but actually we did achieve the usual one point, oh, sorry, we assumed 1.4, but did achieve the 1.5. Shana, next, thank you. <laughs> um, so the key features of what we did, the questionnaire, we, we shortened it by 15 minutes um, to a 30 minute that we felt that was optimal for telephone interview. Um, we focused, as I said, on national indicators, um, but for some of those modules, we, we cut them where we could, um, but we had to work out retaining which key questions we needed in order to calculate the usual DVs. Um, that was an interesting exercise in itself. Um, and also to make sure that they were, they were relevant for, for the time, a short time period rather than an annual um, time period. Um, we also replaced things like the longer physical activity module with validated skills um, and we used IPAC for physical activity. We also um, did not include any show cards. Um, the interviewers read out answer options to interviewees. Um, high pro so within the self-completes, those modules that were um, linked to national indicators or used to, to measure national indicators or were high, considered high priority by policy were included um, in the actual interview. So we took them out of the self-complete and interviewers asked these questions. So we translated them into um, the CAPI programme. Um, we also introduced some questions on COVID-19 diagnosis, shielding um, and lockdown behaviour changes, such as whether or not people felt that they had changed their drinking behaviour, um, physical activity, et cetera, during lockdown. Um, we also asked for health self-report heights and weights. So we did expect that the estimates that we would get from the snapshot survey would be um, different from the usual annual estimates. Um, and we knew that there would be some mode effects um, I'd expected that. So we did class these as experimental statistics. There is a report available on the Scottish Government website of the survey. Um, many of our estimates were quite close to usual estimates. Um, for example, cardiovascular disease, um, asthma, COPD, um, and some of the discretionary food consumption. However, some estimates appear to be much more affected by the change in approach than others, such as smoking. Um, so we, our estimate in the 2020 telephone survey was 9%. And although the smoking rate's been going down in recent years, um, it has, hasn't gone down that far and it's around about 17 to 19% since 2017. So we wouldn't have expected that 9% is a, is a um, true reflection of the smoking um, behavior within the population. It's probably an underestimate. Um, there are a number of changes within um, that we made to the method that may have affected this. For example, young adults usually are asked about smoking and self-complete. This was moved to the interview, um, which would obviously um, perhaps make them less likely to report smoking behavior. 
Um, there's also, we also believe there's some kind of self-selection bias within an opt-in sample in that people who are more healthy um, are more likely to opt in, which again could have meant for lower reporting. Also within our sample, the more de most deprived areas were um, probably we had about half of the proportion that we normally do in the face-to-face -face survey. So they were very underrepresented in their sample. And of course, smoking is, is, is much more com um, prevalent within the most deprived areas. We did wait for this, but it didn't fully adjust for it, which also suggests that the samples that we got in the most deprived areas are also possibly not representative of um, those areas and that, the, you know, probably the more healthy people in those areas and we're likely to opt in. So, oh, <laughs> need to go back one time. Ready? <laughs> so just to, um, very quickly, um, what we think the impact of the method changes were in the data, it's, it's been difficult to unravel that. Um, and that's been, you know, to unravel between the impact of sample, the impact of mode effect, and that's been compounded by the fact that we were actually collecting data in the context of COVID-19, which we also expect would impact, especially the lockdown. We were just coming out of lockdown and we were collecting the data, but we did expect there had been impacts on people's health behaviours, such as diet and physical activity, et cetera, and their mental well-being. Um, but for, for now, we do know that the key, and we're going to keep analysing that, and especially thinking towards the 2021 um, survey um, reporting. But for now, we can say that the key impacts on our estimates are probably um, very linked to, to the lower response rates of the uh, less representative sample, but also particularly less representative in terms of SAND. We also had an older sample and they were more likely to be homeowners than our usual face-to-face -face sample. We also, the snapshot that, um, of the six weeks doesn't account for seasonal variation, which we account for obviously by doing an annual sample and spreading our sample across um, that um, evenly. We also, in terms of mode effect, um, I think as Chloe mentioned in, in telephone, there's less rapport than in face-to-face, -face, therefore potentially more less inclination for people to um, provide sensitive information, particularly around mental health. Um, where we think there's been, probably been some under-reporting um, and that's been compounded also the fact that we didn't collect the mental health data as usual in self-complete. Social desirability is also more likely in face-to-face -face, um, data collection and there's a potential for people to over-report face positives such as general health. We wondered just within the context of COVID-19 as well, whether people are more likely to judge their general health as better um, in comparison to what's going on in the um, population generally. Um, also with self-report self for height and weight, people are more likely to um, feel that they're taller and weigh less um, than they actually do, so um, under-reporting of obesity. And also we think with the telephone interview, there's more likelihood of, self, of status Icing, that's a difficult word to say, um, where people kind of, you know, skip through the answer, um, the answers, giving the minimum information just to get through the questionnaire. Um, I'll now hand on to Shanna. She's going to tell you about how we adapted um, the 2021 survey based on the learning from 2020. Thanks, Joanne. Um, okay, so yeah, going on, sorry, I'm echoing a little bit. Um, yeah, so going on to what we did in 2021, um, again, based on the things that we learned from the telephone survey. Um, okay, so the key features of the 2021 survey um, where we extended the data collection period from April to December, and there will also be a, a kind of mop up in January and February. So this is a lot closer to our kind of annual January to December fieldwork period. So hopefully, again, reducing the chance of season, seasonal variation um, in the data. It's still cu currently running as an opt-in telephone survey, and we do hope to go to knock to nudge um, as soon as possible, really, um, as, as soon as the Scottish Government um, give us the go ahead with that. Again, it's using um, a PATH sample based on a, a kind of in-between um, response rate of between the kind of 15% best case and the 
um, 10% that we had assumed for 2020. But it does mean a huge increase in the number of addresses that we've issued. So you'll see there it's 64,500. And annually, we look to issue about 10,000. Um, so it's a lot more uh, for this telephone opt-in. And that is to achieve the same adult and same number of adult and child interviews as we would in an annual survey. So those 5,000 adult interviews and 2,000 child interviews are what we would aim to achieve in a face-to-face -face approach over the whole year. And similarly to other Scottish Health Survey years, we hope to deposit the 21 data in autumn 2022 after our reporting period. Okay, so yeah, again, kind of following on from what um, Joanne picked up in her presentation, um, one of the things that we aim to do was to address this issue with the, the bias in the sample, basically. So we introduced a targeted incentive strategy, and that was the purpose of that was to increase the level of part participation among those living in the most deprived, uh, deprived areas. So that's a uh, quintile one and two in Scotland. We also reinstated the full questionnaire. So while the downside was that it would be a little bit longer, it would allow us to create those derived variables that we use for looking at um, kind of trend series and those national indicators to make sure that they're being measured consistently, kind of going back to 2019, the last normal kind of face-to-face -face approach. It also would, um, and that is linked to the reintroduction of response cards, so allowing those questions to be exactly as they were in a face-to-face -face approach, which hopefully will allow us to flip back into a face-to-face -face, uh, survey at any point in 2021 as well. We also introduced an online self-completion to kind of mitigate against those mode effects that we had with the questions that moved to interview or administered as part of the telephone survey. So the kind of um, more sensitive topics around mental health, problem drinking, gambling, those kinds of um, modules moved into an online self-completion, which was administered. Shana, sorry, so, you yeah. only have a minute or two left. Okay, sure. Um, and yeah, so we did include Intake 24. This time we're also collecting information about from children and we are allowing concurrent interviewing. Okay, so very briefly going to touch on some of the impacts of these changes. So we have had a slightly lower response to the 2020 opt-in. Um, we're down at kind of 10%, but again, this is just from April um, fieldwork, so it's still quite early. A slightly lower particip participation among children um, and yeah, kind of limited impact of the targeted incentives, although again, it is a bit too early to assess that. On the plus side, we've had really great response rates for the online self-completion at 88%, with the vast majority completing online, which I think in terms of methodological advances is really positive. And again, linked to that high response for intake 24, which is again online. Okay, so this is just a bit of a brief overview of next steps. So for 2021, we'll continue to monitor um, the implementation of these changes possibly thinking about things like QR codes. Um, as I've already mentioned, hope to go to a not to nudge approach because we know that response rates are higher and it reduces the sample bias with that as well. Um, and yet, as Joanne's mentioned, starting to think about 2021 and the implications for the data. And finally, 2022 survey um, is underway in terms of planning and hopeful of going back in a, as a face-to-face -face approach with telephone contingency. Okay, and that's uh, Joanne and I's contact details um, as well if there's any anything else. Thank you. Excellent, M many thanks to Shana and Shan for, for the presentation. Okay, everybody. Uh, let's make let's make a start again. So we have two more presentations before um, we have another break. Uh, so we're starting off with the Opinions and Lifestyle Survey and the European Health Interview Survey. So both um, are presented by Emma Penster from the Office of National Statistics. Uh, she's both she's a social researcher 
and works in social service operations and various surveys and is currently working on, a, on the Opinions and Lifestyle Survey and the European Health Interview Survey. So, Emma, over to you. Thanks. Um, Gita, are you able to share your, your screen or is it not working? Can you see my screen? Yes. Great. Yep, okay. that looks good. Right. I'll make a start then. Um, so, Emma and I will talk you through two of the surveys that we work on at the ONS. Um, so to start, I will provide a bit of background to the Opinions and Lifestyle Survey and share some of our recent findings. I'll then cover some improvements that we have made to the OPM in the last year and then hand over to Emma, who will talk about the European Health Interview Survey and the questions covered, findings from wave two and plans for the latest wave. So the Opinions and Lifestyle Survey is an online survey consisting of individuals aged 16 years and over. It's an omnibus survey, so customers can commission questions on a variety of topics. Um, it's predominantly online, which, but it has a telephone element to it for participants who are unable to um, participate online. Um, so before COVID, the data was collected eight months of the year, so two months on, one month off. The sample was 2,000 individuals per month with approximately 1,100 responses. Uh, but from March last year, the OPN became a weekly survey to understand how the coronavirus pandemic has been affecting life in Great Britain. So it's prim primarily commissioned by Cabinet Office. Although questions can be sponsored by other government departments and organisations provided this based on the survey. Um, around 6,000 adults are sampled with approximately 4,000 responses. So the sample is drawn from respondents who have taken part in previous ONS household surveys, such as the labour market survey. Uh, two stage approaches apply to sampling. So in the first stage, a sample of households are drawn from the sampling frame. And then at the second stage, one individual from each sampled household is selected. And more recently, we've started using earlier OPM waves to boost our sample. So we generally have a four week timeline where we're working on four different waves at the same time. Um, so to put this in context, um, sampling for wave 68 will have started early this week. OPN 67 is being designed ready to go into field for next week. OPN 66's data collection started yesterday and OPN 65 data was processed on Monday um, and was sent ready for us to analyze and get ready for tomorrow's publication. So to provide a bit more detail on the design aspect, um, this is a weekly iterative process. So the question is developed in collaboration with stakeholders and through customer consultations. A draft questionnaire is designed and the team work with design experts to ensure that we are using harmonized questions where available and to ensure that our questions meet ONS and accessibility standards. Uh, once the draft is finalized and signed off, the content is handed over to our survey operations team who program the questionnaire and carry out three rounds of testing. As part of the process, data is weighted to make a representative of the GB population. So typically younger and BME groups tend to be less likely to take part. So um, underrepresented groups are accounted for during the waiting process. And once the data is processed and weighted, it's sent to my team ready for analysis. So data is analyzed and published as part of our, of the coronavirus and social impacts article, which is published every Friday. Um, and we also send early sightings of the data to cabinet office, as well as other government departments to inform policy and to evaluate existing policies. Um, in terms of what other areas that our estimates are used, um, we also deliver them to other areas within ONS for inclusion in their articles and dashboards. So, for example, a handful of our indicators feed into the impacts of coronavirus on the economy publication, which is also a weekly publication. In addition to the weekly outputs, we have carried out additional analysis on particular subgroups or topics. So for example, coronavirus and depression in adults, its impact on caring and homeschooling during the pandemic. We've also pulled data sets to provide in-depth analysis. Um, so for example, to understand vaccine hesitancy in subgroups of the population. 
Um, so our latest detailed findings were published on 26th of June. These charts show a time series of our main indicators. Um, so here we can see that compliance behaviours to stop the spread of the virus remained high with majority of adults engaging in hand washing, wearing a face cover, maintaining social distance and avoiding physical contact when outdoors. However, compared to May last year, there have been decreases in the percentage of adults who have been washing their hands, maintaining social distance and avoiding physical contact. As lockdown measures have been easing, there's been an increase in the percentage of adults who report meeting up indoors and outdoors, and we also see increases in those traveling to work. And since December last year, positive vaccine sentiment has increased, with 96% of adults reporting that they've either had a vaccine, waiting to receive one, or likely to have it when offered, um, compared to 78% in December. In terms of well-being, life satisfaction has and feeling that things done in life are worthwhile have been relatively stable since the beginning of May this year and remain below pre-pandemic levels. Happiness has increased since the start of the pandemic. In early June, happiness levels had reached pre-pandemic levels. However, it's slightly decreased in recent weeks. Similarly, anxiety levels were close to pre-pandemic levels in early June, but have slightly increased recent, in recent weeks to 3.8. In terms of life returning to normal, 21% reported that they felt life would return to normal in six months or less. People were a lot more optimistic at the start of the pandemic. However, we have seen a gradual decrease, um, especially in more recent weeks. And this appears to be around the time infection rates were increasing and when the delay of step four was announced. 29% felt it will take more than a year for life to return to normal. And 8% of adults felt that life would never return to normal. So our data shows high positive vaccine sentiment, and this is a case across all age groups. Um, so as we're targeting more of the younger age groups, I've got some stats on that. So for 16 to 29 year olds, 93% report positive vaccine sentiment, where 42% have received at least one dose, 24% have been offered a vaccine and waiting, and 28% would be likely to have one when offered. So last week, we published an update on hesitancy towards the vaccine. This is based on pooling four weeks worth of data to understand subgroups of the population. Um, vaccine hesitancy refers to adults who have been offered a vaccine and decided not to be vaccinated or would be unlikely to have a vaccine if offered. Our latest findings show that younger adults are more likely to be vaccine hesitant. Um, greater vaccine hesitancy was reported among 16 to 17 year olds at 14%. Um, black or black British adults had the higher rates of vaccine hesitancy compared with white adults. London had the highest percentage of vaccine hesitancy compared to other regions in England. And those living in the most deprived areas of England were more likely to report vaccine hesitancy than those in least deprived areas. So our data is regularly picked up in the media. It's appeared during daily press briefings and numerous national and local news outlets covering a variety of topics, latest being on attitudes to vaccines and socializing. So since autumn last year, we have, in, we have continued to make improvements to the OPN. Um, so for example, we've reduced the data collection period from 10 days to five days to ensure timely data, timely reporting of the data. We've increased the sample size from 2000 to 6000 to allow for more granular analysis. And we've also made changes to how we publish the data with the aim to reduce the number of tables that we publish. So last autumn, this was as high as 20, but now we have a set of core 11 tables that we publish on a weekly basis. Um, we've also established key indicators in line with the government's hand space and space agenda, agenda, which we publish as a time series. And we also publish time series data on well-being indicators and return to normal, which have been topics of interest for some time. Um, so standardizing our data tables mean that we've been able to automate some of our manual work where lots, large amounts of time are spent on copying and pasting estimates. And this has resulted in us being able to resource um, half our, our team's resource. So we, um, yeah, it's a lot more, le lot less resource intensive now. Um, OPN analysis, 
the, so the OPN anonymized data sets are available in the SRS. And I've already mentioned that we do, we also make the data available on our ONS website as part of our weekly publications. Um, so I'll now hand you over to Emma, who will talk about EHIS. Yeah, thanks, Gita. So I'll be talking about EHIS, which is the European Health Interview Survey. So EHIS is a survey that collects health data in a consistent form across European Union member states, providing the opportunity to compare health indicators with other countries. Uh, wave two was conducted in 2013 to 2014 and was completed by 16,843 respondents in the UK. And data were collected via face-to-face -face and telephone interviews. Uh, unfortunately, work on EHIS Wave 3 data has been delayed due to COVID priority work. However, um, the latest wave uh, ran from July 2019 to March 2020 in the UK and was completed by 12,466 individuals in the UK. Uh, EHIS Wave 3 was combined with OPN, so the whole household did um, the EHIS modules and then one person was randomly selected to complete the OPN questions. Can I have the next slide, Gita? Sorry. So um, EHIS uses um, harmonized questions across three modules. These are the health status, healthcare, and health determinants modules. Uh, this table shows the three modules and the different sub-modules they include to give you an idea of what data was collected. Uh, the health status module is a central point of the survey. It focuses on measuring the health status of the population in general, as well as in relation to specific health problems. Uh, so questions include your generic self-perceived health question, uh, chronic health conditions and how these impacts on daily tasks and also some mental health questions. The healthcare module focuses on collecting data on healthcare services and unmet healthcare needs. They ask about time spent in hospital, medications, preventative services like flu jabs and blood tests and any delays to getting healthcare. And finally, the health determinants module focuses on measuring aspects in lifestyles or health related behaviours on someone's health state. So this covers weight and height, which we then use to create BMI. Uh, physical activity, social support, and also alcohol consumption. So I'll be through go through some of the findings from wave two. The primary analytical approach taken here was to facilitate comparisons between the UK and its constituent countries, was to estimate health indicators using direct age standardization to the European Standard Population 2013. However, for some indicators, means and standard, devi standard deviations were calculated. All analyses were calculated by sex and on the following geographies, UK, England, Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland and data was not reported where sample sizes were too small, so less than 30 as this would be unreliable data wise. So some of the key findings were the majority of UK population reported the self perceived health as good, however almost half the population reported having a long standing illness, so this was 45.6% of men and 47.7% of women. The five most common chronic conditions in the UK for men and women were allergy, hypertension, low back disorder, asthma and depression, and a greater proportion of women reported they were limited in physical activities because of a health problem compared to men. So this slide just shows a graph of the BMI categories in men and women across the UK. So over 50% of the UK population had a BMI of greater than 25. This classified them as overweight, obese or morbidly obese. So this was 57.6% of men and 51.2% of women. And furthermore, 34.6% of men and 45.6% of women were classified as having a normal, so this would be a healthy BMI, and only a small number of the UK population were considered underweight. So finally, just a couple of findings on alcohol consumption. So more men reported drinking alcohol every day compared to women. A greater proportion of women reported they did not drink or have never drank alcohol. So this was 19.9% compared to men at 13.5%. And on average, both men and women drank alcohol on three out of seven days in a week. So the data for EHIS Wave 2 is available on the UK data service. And there's also some reference tables that have been published on the UNS website. So what are our plans for EHIS Wave 3 data? So as I mentioned, all the collection has been completed. Unfortunately, processing analysis has been delayed due to high priority COVID work that came into the office. Currently, plans are to release reference tables with a percentage change from wave two, which I think would be an interesting comparison. And hopefully there'll also be some more in-depth analysis on disability and inequality done uh, also within the ONS. Uh, as a side note, the depression data from collected use from EHIS Wave 3 has been used as a pre-pandemic comparison. So in the publication, as Gita mentioned earlier, about um, depression and coronavirus, um, 
EHIS data was used to measure the pre-pandemic level and then compared to OPN depression and wellbeing data during the pandemic. And hopefully data for wave three of EHIS will be available on the UK data service in autumn 2021. Uh, thank you for listening and if you wish to get in contact with either myself or Gita or have any specific questions here's um, our email addresses. Thank you very much Emma and Gita. Um, right so we are moving on to our next presentation which is uh, by Tomi Kapadia. It's about the equality, and nas uh, equality national surveys so documenting the lives of ethnic and religious minorities in a time of crisis. Uh, Dermy is a lecturer in sociology at the University of Manchester and a member of the ESSC Centre on Dynamics of Ethnicity. Uh, she is a mixed methods researcher with interest in racism, mental health and illness, stigma and older people. Uh, she has also conducted research in ethnic inequalities in women's use of mental health services, socioeconomic inequalities in suicide, as well as undertaken work looking at ethnic inequalities in the labour market and the role of social networks in poverty for different ethnic groups. Um, so over to you, Darby. Good morning, everyone, and thanks for your attention to listen to the last of the cross-sectional studies. So this is kind of slightly different to the other studies you've heard of. So thanks very much to Mary for the introduction. I'm going to be telling you about the Evidence for Equality National Survey. Um, so this is a survey that is looking at how the COVID-19 pandemic and the associated lockdowns have affected the lives of ethnic and religious minority groups. So this is a, a new national survey. Um, and it's the largest survey of ethnic and religious minorities in Britain, that's in England, Scotland and Wales. And we're hoping that this survey will have a greater coverage of ethnic minority groups than any other national survey currently. And um, we're funded by the U U UCRI Economic, so Economic and Social Research Council via a COVID-19 ethnicity rapid response call. And the data collection for our survey started on the 16th of February and it will end on the 28th of July of this year. So the rationale for the study was that we know that ethnic and religious minority groups within the UK have been very badly affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. So, for example, the ethnic minority groups that suffer the highest rates of, rates of infection, the highest rates of mortality, and, and are at most risk of mortality are those groups with the worst health and socioeconomic outcomes um, for the past few decades. So these are the Pakistani, Bangladeshi, Black African and Black Caribbean groups. That is, of course, based on uh, groups for which we have substantial data for. There are also significant inequalities, for example, for the Gypsy and Irish traveller populations and for Jewish groups as well. So we, we really wanted to do this survey to ensure that the inequalities faced by these groups are properly documented and we can look at reasons for why the case for these inequalities, what, what the reasons are for these inequalities. Um, looking at both experiences of historical racism as well as contemporary conditions that have created these inequalities during the COVID-19 pandemic. So we really want to get at the diversity of experience. And I'll go on to some of the, the content of the survey just shortly. So the survey is administered by Ipsos Mori, and these are the core team members here listed. And it is led academically by people working at the Centre on Dynamics of Ethnicity. And as Mary mentioned, this is an ES, ESRC funded centre, and it's the largest centre in the UK that investigates ethnic inequalities in lots of different life, uh, life domains. So it's led, the survey is led by Dr. Nisa Finney at the University of St. Andrews and those academics at the University of Manchester and the University of Sussex as well that are involved um, in various parts of the survey. So just to say a little bit about the survey setup, our funding to do this survey was awarded in September 2020. So we had to work extremely quickly to first of all um, get a tender together to contract a survey company. We had to design the survey questionnaire, really paying attention to the content, uh, as well as being, uh, as well as including questionnaires from existing surveys, so that we had a benchmark. We had to obtain ethical approval for this survey, and for those of you who've done this ethical approval process before, you will know it's very long, 
um, complicated and time intensive. We also translated the survey materials and many other things in order to be able to launch um, in February 2021. And one of the other crucial aspects of the work we did was to build partnerships with key race equality community organisations, charities and think tanks. And this is due to our sampling staff strategy, which I'll go on to shortly. So we are a partnership with 13 voluntary and community organisations that are listed here, um, such as the Race Equality Foundation, Operation Blackfoot, Running Me Trust, um, Stuart Hall Foundation, Friends, Families and Travellers who work with Gypsy and Irish Traveller and Roma groups. Um, and these were really so that we could get access to the study, the people that we wanted for the study, the people that we wanted to fill in the survey. And this is because our survey uses a non-probability sampling method. So anybody who defines themselves as being a member of a religious or ethnic minority group is eligible to take part in the survey. Sorry, I should say that this is adults aged 18 plus. Uh, and by doing this, we wanted to be able to capture more ethnic minority and religious minority groups than are traditionally captured in the national surveys that we have currently and also to enable both within group analysis and across group analysis. So because we have this kind of sampling strategy, we had to undertake monitoring of quota targets. So we have a very large spreadsheet, which is a four way cross tabulation between ethnicity, age, sex and geographical location to try. And these are kind of the quotas are calculated using um, FPOP calculations or population estimates to get an idea of how many people of uh, each of those characteristics that I mentioned in each of the areas that I mentioned. And our statistician on the project, Professor Natalie Shlomo, has been using our indicators, so this is fairly new technology within non-probability sampling methods, to make sure that our, even though we're using a non-probability sampling method, we get an element of representativeness into our survey. Um, and we, we do this using two, set, two different approaches. So we can um, use propensity, propensity score matches uh, approaches or model-based approaches. And if you've got more kind of involved questions about um, how this kind of new, new kind of method is used, um, in this survey, then please let me know. And I will have to go back to Natalie for that because it is, it is um, a bit beyond my um, expertise. So these are the groups for which we have target sample sizes, so the ethnic minority groups, and they largely map on to the census 2011 categories, because when we were doing, when we were designing the survey, that's the categories we had, but obviously we knew that there would be a Roma category, so we ensured that we had target sample size of Roma groups, but we also split the black African group into those from sub-Saharan sub Africa and those who are not, because we know that there's specific inequalities affecting groups with uh, origins in sub-Saharan Africa. So for example, Somali groups in this country. And we also had a target for Jewish groups. So um, we had a very ambitious target of 17,000 respondents we probably won't get to 17,000. We're hoping to get over 10,000. Um, and the survey is still open for three more weeks. So we're hoping to meet that target. But we also have a general population sample consisting of mainly white British people for comparison purposes. And these people are recruited from Ipsos Mori's existing panels. And they've already been recruited and we have an N of just over 3,000. And just to say this was done in waves. So um, not all of the general population sample was um, recruited right at the beginning of the survey. They were done in waves, so uh, kind of one in February, one in March, one in April, 1,000 people each, just so that could kind of match with the, the time differences with the, other, with the ethnic minority population that's being recruited. So this is an online survey. Um, um, but it can also be done over the telephone. So the online survey takes 30 minutes, the telephone survey takes 40 minutes, and it's available in 14 languages. And the participants receive a voucher as a thank you for this. But uh, predominantly people have taken part online. There's been very few catty um, interviews. So these are the languages that the survey is available in. 
And I'm just going to go through a, a few of the topics, highlight some of the topics that we ask about. So we have um, demographic information. We have uh, uh, questions about ethnic, religious and migrant identity. And importantly, as well as using categories for um, ethnic identity, we also have a writing box as well for people to say how they um, describe themselves. We have um, a module on racism and discrimination. And importantly, for the first time in a national UK survey, we are measuring lifetime racist discrimination, not just racism uh, experienced in the past year, which is what we have in other national surveys. We have um, things on health and wellbeing, uh, which I'll go into it a little bit more in, in a couple of slides. We have people's views on how they may have been policed during the pandemic and how they've been involved in the Black Lives Matter movement and other activism. So just to this is the just a snapshot of what's available in the health module. So and the source uh, of those questions. So we've got general health, LLTI, as you would expect, some uh, measures of mental health as well as medical conditions. We've got um, questions on access to health and social care services during the pandemic and what kind of care, you know, people um, were receiving care, whether that's changed during the pandemic. Questions on COVID-19 symptoms, um, whether they would have a vaccine or whether they've already had it, um, if they've suffered a bereavement of close people to them. So just a little note on participant recruitment. I mentioned that we've got these 13 partners that we're working with, but we've had to do a, an immense amount of um, social media and other kind of recruitment techniques. So um, we have a dedicated, even social, uh, dedicated social media channels on Instagram, Twitter and Facebook, including adverts on Facebook. We have sent these emails uh, kind of done like very nice e-shops that can be used for emails, for mailing lists, for listserv, um, adapted for WhatsApp as well. We've appeared on BBC local radio numerous times to promote the survey. Some of these on ethnic minority specific programmes or religious programmes. We also have a partnership with Sky News to um, do four reports on the survey, two of which have already been released. We've also advertised in Asian language newspapers and magazines and radio to ensure that we're um, recruiting people who don't speak English as a first language who would come on, who would be eligible for the survey. And we also recruited by the Greater Manchester Health Register Research for Futures, uh, where people sign up to be sent information about surveys to participate in. We also inquired with the Scottish Health Register as well, uh, but we weren't able to do that because NHS ethics approval is required to advertise there. Um, and just to say that we will be doing some further recruitment in the last few weeks of further so in the sample of ethnic and religious minority groups using the Ipsos Mori Knowledge Panel, using um, a company called Prolific, who have a database of people willing to take part in surveys. And importantly, I just wanted to mention this as well. Um, we know that surveys in the UK do not enumerate Gypsy, Irish, Traveller and Roma people in proportions where they can be um, analyze as their own subgroup. So we are actually taking approach of hiring community interviews to go out with tablets and devices to traveller sites in the UK um, to assist people to help, to assist them to fill in the survey. And we're doing that in partnership with friends, families and travellers. And we couldn't have done that if we didn't have that partnership. So just some very preliminary findings here. So, you know, there's no kind of statistical models, there's no graphs because the day, the sample is not complete yet. But I mentioned this new lifetime measure of racism and discrimination. So um, this is asking people if they've experienced discrimination and it could be in their jobs, it could be fear of going out, it could be verbal abuse. And nine out of 10 black respondents had experienced racism over the life course. And eight out of 10 Asian respondents and those identifying uh, as a mixed in mixed or multiple ethnic groups had experienced racism over the life course. And I'm just reporting this for aggregated ethnic groups because of the, um, the kind of initial nature of the findings. When we do report findings, this will be for disaggregated ethnic minority groups as far as possible. And by religion, nine out of 10 Sikh respondents have reported this kind of lifetime racist discrimination. 
It's eight out of 10 for Muslim, Hindu and Buddhist respondents and seven out of 10 of Jewish respondents reported this. And just in terms of health findings, there's some indication that people's uh, ethnic minority groups' mental health has been worse during the pandemic than the white majority groups. So in terms of one of the items on the CESD, one out of three white respondents felt depressed in the last week, but this was over four out of 10 for black and Asian respondents. Similarly, for um, feeling nervous or anxious taken from the generalised anxiety disorder scale, six out of 10 white respondents said they felt nervous or anxious, but this figure was more than seven out of 10 for black, Asian, mixed and other respondents. So just again, just to uh, caveat these findings, these are very preliminary. We don't have a final sample and we haven't created the weights yet to apply to these data. Um, so just a very quick timeline here, you know, we're in the uh, kind of second bit here, 28th of July, the, the survey closes. In August and September, there's quite a lot of statistical work to be done to create the weights um, and uh, kind of get the sample get the data ready for deposit with the UK data service where it can be used by people who have attended this conference. Um, and then we'll also have a, you know, a, a plan of analyses and we'll be re releasing kind of publications, briefing reports in the, in the coming year. And just to say the survey is still live and you can take part if you identify from being a, an ethnic or religious minority. So you can, that's the bit.ly link there. It takes you straight into the survey. Is a free phone number and if you want to find out a bit more before taking part you can go to evensurvey.co.uk or follow us on instagram or twitter at evensurvey so i think i'll stop there because i don't know if i've gone over time so thanks for listening that's all right thank you <clears throat> thank you for a really fascinating presentation we are definitely waiting you back for next year to present the findings it looks like from your timeline that you should be ready by that time so yeah cannot wait and really impressed with all of the uh, community engagement and, and getting the groups on board um as well